Hey there guys, this is Richard, your host, with another marvellous video. If you ever wondered what happened to Childs or McCready after the end of the first film, or if you think of the thing's future before you go to bed, trust me, you're in the correct place. As the title of this video suggests, I'll take you on a thrill ride across the two The Thing movies and the various comic books that came after the story, including one which takes place as far back as 1121 AD. Without wasting any more time, let's begin this tentacle-filled, otherworldly joyride. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Complete Timeline of the Ultimate Otherworldly Terror According to the Movies in the year 1982, and the grim and icy white deserts of Antarctica, a Norwegian scientist and two others aboard a snowcat follow a signal through the thick ice. Upon reaching the spot that the signal was coming from, they fall into a fissure and the snowcat gets stuck. The headlights of the snowcat lead to an epic discovery. The Norwegians find an alien spaceship. A scientist named Sander rushes to Kate Lloyd, an American paleontologist, to tell her about the monumental discovery. Pilots Sam Carter and Derek Jameson fly Kate and Adam to the Norwegian camp called Tule. At the camp, we're introduced to more characters. It's now that we get the full view of the alien ship, and not very far away from the ship lays an unearthly organism. As would have been expected, the scientists removed the organism from the ice and brought it to the camp to keep it in a wooden room while the organism was still encased in thick ice. Sander says that they should take a tissue sample before the organism is moved out, but Kate objects to the suggestion because they need to take care of sterilization and other precautionary measures. However, Sander ignores the paleontologist and forbids her from speaking against him in the future. Sander goes on with his plan and a frozen flesh sample is extracted. Later, while the crew celebrates the discovery, Jameson's curiosity leads him to the alien in the ice block. But the ice block had been melting. Once it had melted just enough, the alien broke out of its icy prison and jumped out of the ceiling. A terrified Jameson runs to the rest of the crew to alert them. They initially don't believe him because the alien had been buried in the ice for a hundred thousand years. It was nearly impossible for it to remain alive after all these years. Nevertheless, Sander divides the team into groups of two and three to search for the alien. Soon, one group finds the bloody remains of a pet dog, presumably belonging to Lars, a Norwegian who didn't understand English. Finally, Olav and Henrik find the thing hiding under one of the buildings. This is the first time that we get a good look at the monster. Its slimy, beetle-like body came adorned with hideous and dangerous crab-like limbs, numerous tentacles, and a large mouth with long, razor-sharp teeth. One of the tentacles impales Henrik and pulls him. The chaos attracts the attention of the others, who come to the spot and shoot the thing, but that doesn't really have any great effect on the monster. Ultimately, they kill the creature by burning it. The thing had started consuming Henrik, and the creature fell to its death, with poor Henrik still hanging out of its mouth. Quite obviously, they're all in a state of shock. Later, Carter tells the team that he'll take Olaf from the base for medical attention. Meanwhile, Sander convinces the others that although they faced a tragedy, this was their only chance to study an extraterrestrial creature. He starts an autopsy with the help of Kate, who notices that the skin and the tissues of Henrik looked almost new. She also finds a titanium bar that has been previously installed inside Henrik's arm, which was now out of his body. Nevertheless, Kate herself takes blood samples from Henrik and studies them under a microscope. To her utter disbelief and shock, she finds that Henrik's cells were being replicated by the Thing's cells. She immediately comes to the conclusion that the Thing's modus operandi was attacking a potential victim and then replicating them. The following day, Kate also finds mental dental fillings on the bathroom floor. Apart from this, there was plenty of blood nearby. Meanwhile, the pilots had taken off Olav and another Norwegian named Griggs. Kate rushes to the helicopter, but finds it in the air. However, she manages to fly them down as Crater decides to land. The decision to land the helicopter panicked Griggs, and almost immediately his face split and his chest opened up from which came out numerous long tentacles and a set of teeth that resembled a rib cage. Quite evidently, Griggs had been attacked by the thing previously, but the helicopter could not ultimately land. Kate and Sander looked on helplessly as the helicopter crashed at some distance. Later, Kate explains to everyone her theory about the thing and how it operates. 
She tells them that the thing replicates people but only their organic parts, and she also says that the thing cannot replicate inorganic substances. But this seemed to be a far-fetched theory, even by scientific standards. No one but Juliet believes Kate, and she tells Kate that they can steal the snowcat keys to stop people from leaving. Juliet brings Kate to a secluded room where she herself transforms into the Juliet thing. Although Kate manages to run with her life, the Juliet thing kills one of the Norwegians who is standing in the hallway. Fortunately for everyone, Lars burns the Juliet thing with a flamethrower. It was now that everybody believed Kate and her theory that the thing was like a virus that needed to be isolated and then killed once and for all. Sander suggested that he and Adam could prepare a test. However, the test could not be prepared because somebody had put the camp on fire. The commotion continued as Jameson and Carter returned from the crash site, but everybody believed that they might be replicated aliens. And I can't really disagree, because surviving such a crash was nearly impossible. Nevertheless, Kate says that the pilot should be locked up instead of killed, because if they were not infected, killing them would be murder. With the test kits destroyed, Kate comes up with another plan. She checks for dental fillings in each person, and everyone except Sander, Colin, Edward, and Adam are eliminated. She then asks Lars to bring the pilot, but they had escaped, and Lars gets attacked. A scuffle ensues between the pilots and the rest of the crew. It's not before long that Edward's body starts to change. His hands get detached and transform into small, tentacled creatures with a mind of their own. One of these creatures attacks Jonas, much like a facehugger from the Alien franchise. In fact, Edward had become the Edward Thing by now, and his body grew a new set of limbs. The Edward Thing ran towards Adam and started to meld with him, which gave rise to the Edward Adam Thing. It's not before long that this newly formed creature massacred most of the Norwegian scientists. In a desperate attempt to save itself, the Edward Adam Thing leapt out of the window and into the snow, where Kate burns the creature, but finds that the Sander Thing was escaping in one of the snowcats. She immediately understands that the Sander Thing was going to the spaceship to escape from Antarctica. Kate and Carter follow him to the spaceship in another snowcat, and right after getting out of the vehicle, Kate notices something strange about Carter's left ear. Nevertheless, the two of them go inside the spaceship where the Sander Thing attacks Kate. She struggled to save herself from the alien, let alone kill it. However, she ultimately manages to throw a grenade into the Sander Thing's hideous mouth. Now that the Sander Thing had been destroyed, Kate turned her attention to Carter, whose earring was on the wrong ear. Despite his attempts to convince her to let him live, Kate burns him with a flamethrower, and a dying Carter Thing lets out inhuman screeches. That's the last of Kate that we see in the movie, and her fate is left as ambiguous as the fates of Child and McCready at the end of the original film. The 2011 film ends with a Norwegian helicopter landing on the base with Lars still alive. The two men see an Alaskan Malamute escaping into the chilly wilderness, with Lars and the chopper pilot following the dog. Lars keeps on shooting at the dog from the air, but keeps on missing, and this sets the stage for the opening scene of John Carpenter's The Thing. John Carpenter's masterpiece starts with a husky running towards Outpost 31, with a chopper following it and attempting to kill it. Perplexed, the Americans struggled to understand what was happening. One of the Norwegians pulls the pin of a grenade, but instead of throwing it at the dog, he throws it behind him, which takes the chopper along with the pilot. The Norwegian with the gun keeps on shooting the dog, only to be shot down by Gary in self-defense. Confused about the entire episode, the doctor of Outpost 31 named Copper and RJ McCready, the helicopter pilot, go to the Norwegian base to investigate. Here, they find several charred remains of strange creatures with vaguely humanoid attributes. Blair, the biologist of Outpost 31, concludes that the corpses had regular internal organs, but somehow their exteriors had been completely changed and deformed. Anyway, the Americans put the stray husky in the kennel along with their other dogs. And as would have been expected, this new dog transformed into its real form and started attacking the American dogs. The dog handler named Clark discovers assimilated dogs with crab-like legs and several long tentacles. However, the dog king is burnt to the ground with a flamethrower. Blair performs an autopsy and learns the same things about the creature as Kate in the prequel. The next day, McCready goes to the Norwegian site with Norris and Palmer, where they find the alien spaceship and an artificial crater that was formed after the Norwegians removed the ice block containing the alien. Mac theorizes that the Norwegians thawed the ice block and awakened the monster from its 100,000 years of sleep. Blair types in the reports of his findings into the computer, which says that there was a 75% chance that one of the American crew members had been infected. Furthermore, in the event that the thing managed to reach civilization, all of humanity would be infected by the alien within 27,000 hours which is just about three years and one month. Everyone realized how serious the situation was, and the remains of this creature were kept in the storage room. 
Another crew member named Fuchs tells Mac that he had read Blair's notes, and according to them, the creature had probably assimilated and imitated over 1,000 life forms across the depth of space. Meanwhile, Windows finds Bennings being attacked by the thing and rushes to alert the others, but Bennings' thing escapes only to be found by the crew members of Outpost 31, who incinerate Bennings' thing. It turns out that his transformation had not been completed for lack of time. The men return to the base and burn the other two remains of the thing. Blair loses his mind at the possibility that humanity could go extinct, and in a fit of rage, he kills the remaining dogs. The rest realize that he could be a danger to himself and the others, so they lock him away and sedate him. Copper tells the team that a blood serum test should be conducted to find out who are infected, but someone destroys the blood samples, and with this incident, paranoia and claustrophobia blanket the interiors of Outpost 31 as a whiteout storm blankets the exteriors. The following evening, Fuchs is killed off the screen. But things started to go down at Outpost 31, and one thing led to another, and the camp was now rebelling against their de facto leader, Mac. However, he threatened to blow up everybody along with himself with dynamite if they didn't back off. It was now that Norris appeared to have a heart attack and ultimately collapsed on the floor. When Dr. Copper tried to save him using a defibrillator, the chest of Norris opened up in the form of a monstrous jaw that severed Copper's arms. Furthermore, Norris's head detached from the body and grew spider legs, but it was contained before it could do any more damage. It was now evident that any of them could have been infected, so Mac comes up with a plan to figure out which among them was the imposter. He theorized that each part of the thing had a mind of its own and struggled to survive. Likewise, even the thing's blood would act vigorously against a perceived threat, which in this case was supposed to be a hot piece of wire. The test turned out to be rather successful, and it was revealed that Palmer was in fact a thing. The Palmer thing revealed its monstrous form when its head split open and turned into a joint mouth that bit Windows' head. After this, Mac incinerates the Palmer thing and goes on to burn Windows because he'd been infected. Out of the twelve men at Outpost 31, only five survivors remained, including Blair. When Mac, Knowles, and Gary go to check on Blair, they find that he had escaped through the floor and was in the process of building a makeshift spacecraft to escape. Strangely enough, they find Childs running into the storm, which makes them conclude that the Blair thing wanted to hibernate in the cold, until it was discovered by a rescue party because it had no way out. Understanding the gravity of the situation, the survivors decide the outpost should be blown up to prevent global infection. They set TNT charges and use Molotov cocktails, but it's not long before the Blair thing kills Gary. Even Knowles disappears, never to be seen again. In the final scenes of the movie, Mac comes face to face with his enemy, the Blair thing. In a classic example of the phrase, desperate times, desperate measures, Mac throws a lit up dynamite stick on the tentacles of the monster, destroying both the monster and Outpost 31. Mac survives and finds Childs in a shack. Both men sit across each other, they share a bottle of whiskey, but they're unaware if the other person is actually the thing. The film ends here and leaves it up to the audience to decide which among them was the thing, if at all. The story after the movie ends, John Carpenter's original made it seem like Mac was the uninfected one and that Charles could have been the infected one. However, the 1991 comic called The Thing From Another World tells us a completely different story. This two-issue comic is the first of the many comics that we'll be exploring in this video. The comic is a direct sequel to the original film, and it's set nearly a few hours after the destruction of Outpost 31. Charles and Mac were sipping on some J&B while waiting to either freeze to death in the sub-zero temperatures of Antarctica or to be saved by a a rescue team from the howling winds. But things turned in their favor when a Japanese whaling ship called Misaki Maru found McCready and brought him on board for treatment. McCready wakes up after a few hours from his slumber, only to find himself in a state of utter panic and violence. He inquires the Japanese doctor about how he ended up on the ship. It's now that Mac learns that Childs had brought Mac to the coastline, where they were found by the crew of Misaki Maru. Also, Childs had gone back to Outpost 31. Upon hearing this, he gets further agitated and becomes more violent. To save McCready from himself, the Japanese crew sedates him one more time. When he wakes up later, he realizes that it's important to find out if he's been infected by the thing or not. Therefore, he breaks his restraints and takes the blood test that he devised previously. His blood hissed and evaporated, which was a sign that he was clean. The next order of business from Mac was to find the way out of the whaling vessel. He browsed through the ship and ended up finding a Hughes 500 helicopter. Without wasting any time, Mac stole the chopper and flew to Outpost 31 to destroy anything that remained of the various things. After reaching it, he executed his plan, but before he 
who had burned the last one of the corpses, he was stopped by Commander Ruskin and his SEAL team. The man had been sent for a search and rescue operation, and upon finding that Mac was destroying the outpost, they apprehended him and took him prisoner. From the outset, it seemed that Mac was the one who destroyed the outpost. Ruskin didn't believe a word that Mac had to say, but that changed when a soldier named Pybus transformed into a frightening tentacled beast and destroyed the chopper, which was the only getaway for these men. The Pybus thing went on to massacre all the men until only Askin, McCready, and two others remained alive. They managed to take down the creature with a grenade and got into a reluctant partnership to reach the Argentinian base. But the men got lost in the piercing cold of the Antarctic, and if not found by someone, they would slowly freeze to death. However, their luck turned when the Argentinian crew and Childs found them. The comic's second issue starts with McCready, Childs, and Erskine heading to the Argentinian base along with an injured man and armed personnel. But the relatively populist base scared Mac. He knew that it would be a buffet for the thing, and many lives could be lost if one of them was infected. The thing could go loose, and there would be no way of stopping it. However, Childs had already brought the Argentinians up to date with the blood test. They conducted it on everyone, but just before the pilot was to be tested, he transformed into the thing and began assimilating with the doctor. Despite Childs, Mac, and Erskine's attempt to kill it, the creature managed to escape. It was followed by the trio, but they lost the chase on the ice. Furthermore, the sun was about to go down, which made them call the search off. However, while returning, Childs fell into a deep crack which seemed like the thing's hideout. They pulled him out immediately, and Mac rigged the place with explosives to ensure that if anything lived there, it would be destroyed. On their way back, Childs and McCready realized that Erskine was never really given the blood test. Furthermore, the blood test was interrupted by the pilot thing, and it could have been a plot to save Erskine from taking the test. Also, Erskine was somehow in too much of a hurry to reach the radio room to contact the mainland. In Charles's words, Erskine was checking his watch more than a referee in overtime. These suspicious activities made Charles and McCready rush to the radio room, only to find the communication crew murdered and the equipment destroyed. After reading the communication log, McCready learned that Erskine had called in an American submarine for rescue. McCready chased Erskine and even shot him with a rifle, but the impact had little to no effect on the commander, which was more than a sign that Erskine was, in fact, a thing. The cover of Erskine Thing had been blown, and upon realizing that it was a fight-or-flight situation, the Erskine Thing revealed its real grotesque form. Interestingly, the Erskine Thing looked quite like the Dog Thing off Carpenter's original. Erskine Thing slaughtered the submarine's crew, but Mac and Charles followed. The sub was going deep into the depths of the ocean and ended up colliding with a rock. Although the only way to destroy the thing was burning it, they couldn't light up a fire inside a submarine because it would use all the oxygen, and worse, it would breach the hull, letting the water inside. In the end, Charles blew up the hatch and seemingly sacrificed his life in an epic hero move. Mac had found his way to the surface on a small piece of a glacier, but he was drenched, and the icy winds could kill him at any moment. The Thing from Another World, Climate of Fear. But that was not the end of helicopter pilot R.J. McCready. He didn't die of hypothermia or severe frostbite because Argentinians had followed him and Childs when the two went after Erskine. They successfully rescued McCready from a certain death and bring him to their base. But before that, something had happened. One of their own members had been attacked by Erskine Thing that was still assimilating. Furthermore, it turned out that McCready was actually suffering from frostbite and the weather would have quickened his death. Therefore, he was transferred to Argentina for treatment. McCready remained unconscious and woke up several days later under the care of a doctor named Sabia Viale, and the base where he was present was under the command of Sergeant Agapito Quintana. The man had seen way too much to remain non-violent or mentally stable. He had become extremely paranoid. Right after waking up, he attacked those he found and tried to escape, but was immediately stopped. When he found a barn full of sheep, his fears grew larger. Sergeant Agapito had ordered his men to keep the American under strict watch at all times. At the first opportunity, McCready got himself an automatic rifle and unleashed havoc on the poor sheep, and only a tranquilizer dart stopped him and his rage. But Mac's apprehensions became true when one of the sheep turned out to be a thing and attacked the cook. When they opened fire on the sheep thing, it split into several smaller things. The chaos was put to an end only after the sheep things were burned. However, Dr. Sabia correctly concluded that someone among them was infected because the sheep were not present in Antarctica. It had to be someone else who was a part of the rescue party that brought McCready from Antarctica to Argentina. That night was filled with horror, tension, and darkness for everyone present at the base. The same paranoia that once engulfed Outpost 31 had found its way here. To worsen the situation, the men didn't want to get tested out of the fear of being marked false positive, or that Dr. Sabia would subvert their results to kill them in order to save herself. In a strange turn of events, a misanthropic man named Dezado tried to shoot Agapito, but Dezado was instead shot by a soldier named Cruz, who was then instructed by Sergeant Agapito to bury Dezado's body. That night, 
white two men had been ordered to keep watch over the camp. The unfortunate men witnessed a strange figure rising from the darkness of the night. This figure was actually the Desado thing, and it attacked and assimilated with the guards. McCready had managed to escape, but not before tying Sergeant Agapito and destroying all sources of communication. All the efforts of the men to find McCready seemed to be in vain. They reached the hangar, assuming that they might find McCready there, but instead they're welcomed by a humongous Desado thing. It was trying to build itself an aircraft to facilitate an escape. The soldiers rained fire on Desado thing, but to no avail. It was only after McCready arrived with his flamethrower that the thing could be subdued, but not before it transformed a part of its body into an ape-like creature that ran into the nearby jungles. McCready followed the creature, but was surprised to see that Childs and an American team that he was leading had managed to kill the creature. During the course of these events, Childs becomes infected by the thing. The Childs thing chases Dr. Sabia and McCready through the jungles. However, a second American team that was sent with Childs' team torched and killed Childs' thing. Meanwhile, Sergeant Agapito realizes that the thing has infected the entire base. In fact, Ramon thing started assimilating with Agapito. It's well known that desperate times call for desperate measures. So, in order to stop the infection from spreading, Agapito cut off his own arm with a machete. He fled and went into the forest, while the things assumed that he wouldn't be a threat to them because he was injured. One of the things wrapped its body with dynamite and went for a suicide bombing. It killed the entire second unit of Americans, but the commander called in a napalm airstrike before dying. McCready and Dr. Sabia narrowly escaped the mess and reached the hangar where the Desado thing had been encountered. Here, they discovered that the things were busy completing the construction of the aircraft that Desado thing was working on. McCready had begun to lose all hope when the wounded Agapito arrived. He encouraged him, and the three of them then covered the hangar's perimeter with gasoline and torched it. However, a spider thing, almost the size of the hangar, emerged from the shackles and pursued McCready, Sabia, and Agapito. The sergeant was losing an immense amount of blood and was unable to run. So, McCready asked them to split up in the hope that the spider thing would chase him. It worked for a while, but the spider thing cornered McCready. However, the airstrike that the commander had called arrived just in time to burn the hell out of the spider thing. The Thing from Another World, Eternal Vows, 1993 an American sailor named Simon Powell comes to the town of Wallace Harbour in New Zealand on a ship called the Gettysburg. However, Simon and his crew get stuck on the island. Almost as soon as Gettysburg reaches Wallace Harbour, strings of murders shock the entire town. The police had the American ship docked and asked the sailors to stay on the island until the murderer was apprehended. Interestingly enough, instead of feeling caged, Simon decided to use the opportunity to make the best use of the time with his eccentric and super-attractive girlfriend, Jennifer Campbell. After a raunchy session of love, romance, and promises of togetherness, Powell left his girlfriend's house at around midnight. Meanwhile, there was a scuffle at the Wallace Harbour Hotel between an American sailor named Holt and a local named John. Detective Sergeant Roman reaches just in time to end the scuffle and stop things from escalating. He hears the cries of an old fisherman and dashes in the direction, but it's too late and only finds the mutilated body of the fisherman. The old man was attacked by an unearthly creature with tentacles, and to make things more complicated, Sergeant Rowan found that Holt and Powell were near the crime scene. The following day, Jennifer wakes up with a terrible hangover, but leaves for work anyway. She's visited by the sergeant, who asked her many questions about Simon and his whereabouts the previous night. All hell breaks loose for Jennifer Campbell when the sergeant informs her that Simon is dead and his body is found near the docks. The catastrophic news was too much for Jennifer Campbell to bear, and she collapsed. Once back at home, Jennifer kept thinking about her boyfriend and how he must have died. She came to believe that Simon must have found the murderer, and that's why Simon was killed. All of these things kept Jennifer so occupied that she forgot to pay attention to her increasingly changing physical appearance. She was turning more and more monstrous and inhuman. Her cat, on the other hand, was observant enough to notice how inhuman Jennifer was becoming. Scared of her own master, the cat attacked Jennifer, only to be killed by Jennifer, who had by now transformed into a tentacled beast. Strangely enough, she hears the voice of her boyfriend in her head. The voice told her that she was, in fact, dead, but great things were awaiting her as she was going to turn into something entirely different. However, if she were to realize her full potential, she must kill and consume the dead. Jennifer then goes on to say that she remembers everything, but what was Jennifer talking about? What was it that she remembered? In the second issue, Jennifer Thing follows her dead boyfriend's instructions and tries to make her first kill by waiting in the dark for a victim. It was Holt that presented himself before Jennifer Thing, and she tried to kill him with her tentacles, but what happened next surprised Jennifer as much as it surprised the readers. It was actually Simon's Thing which had killed his colleague previously and assimilated with his body. Back at the apartment, 
Simon Thing and Jennifer Thing assimilate with each other's body so that Jennifer Thing can see everything that Simon Thing has seen or, rather, experienced. It turns out that the Erskine Thing from the previous comics had assimilated with a fish. This fish was then caught by the sailors, and the fish thing ultimately infected Simon. The Simon thing also tells the Jennifer thing that she should make her kills only to consume and not to assimilate, because that would mean competition on the small island. It's not before long that Mac arrives on the island and discovers the mutilated remains of Simon Thing's latest victim. The sergeant accuses Mac of the murder, but Mac tells him everything about the thing and the elegant mess that was created by the thing on Outpost 31 and the Norwegian outpost. The two of them resorted to working together and started subjecting people to the blood test. Simon Thing's reality came to the forefront and it transformed into a giant tentacle monster with sharp teeth and several faces across the body. Mac destroys the Simon Thing with a flamethrower, but their problems have not come to an end. Before dying, Simon Thing tells Mac that Jennifer was also a thing. In the third issue of the comic, Mac and the sergeant go to Jennifer's house to try and kill her, but Jennifer Thing proved to be much more powerful than these two men. She escaped from the window and created a distraction for Mac by converting a local named Julian. Julian Thing gave Mac a false lead, but unlike Jennifer and Simon, Julian started converting women of the town not to eat and replenish his dead cells with new ones, but just because he could do whatever he wanted to. As the Simon Thing had anticipated, there was much more competition on Wallace Harbor. Furthermore, Jennifer Thing had become very lonely after the destruction of Simon Thing, so she decided to convert a friend named Sharon. And much like Julian Thing, Sharon Thing was also aggressive. Jennifer Thing realized that it wouldn't take long for the entire town to turn into things, and once that happens, they would start devouring each other for the lack of fresh bodies. Naturally, she wanted to escape the town and go to a civilization where she could hunt only to eat. Meanwhile, Mac and Sergeant Rowan were being chased by several converted locals. The men thought it would be safe to get on board Gettysburg, but they were wrong. They understood that they had to jump into the water to survive, but the sergeant didn't know how to swim, so he asked Mac to leave him behind so that he could distract the things. The Jenny Thing was now an enormous monster that attempted to kill MacReady, but he burned her by lighting the gasoline with his flare gun. The resulting explosion destroyed most of Jenny Thing. In the last bid to survive, it transformed into Jenny's human body and begged MacReady to show mercy, but he'd had enough, and he poured more gasoline before jumping off the ship and into the water. The ship's boiler blasted off, destroying the entire vessel. Upon reaching the shore, a spider-head thing of Jenny's head attacks MacReady, and he quickly kicks it away. But before he could gather the courage to get up and obliterate it, a massive wave pushed MacReady back onto the shore, his head collided with a rock, and he passed out. The Jenny thing was now too weak and was sinking toward the ocean bed. However, Powell Thing's voice told her that she might be able to survive by turning into a different creature, but in doing so, she would lose all of her human memories, including those of Powell's. She visualized herself and Powell for the final time and relived the moments they had shared. Ultimately, she transformed into a fish, the same organism that had turned the Powell Thing. The Thing, The Northman Nightmare Prequel The Northman Nightmare takes the Thing story as far back as 1121 AD, when a group of Vikings reaches the frigid and icy parts of Greenland. The Vikings had been to several parts of the world and fought against vicious people and dangerous beasts. However, Greenland was going to be an entirely new threat. To make things worse, Greenland's topography and environment were as harsh as harsh could be, and the terrain would prove to be their strongest opponent. Once the Vikings reached the icy waters, they abandoned the ships because sailing further would cause irreparable damage to the ships. As they started walking, one of the Vikings got pulled by a tentacled beast. Unfortunately for him, none of the other Vikings could see what exactly attacked their comrade. The second in command of this Viking party was called Horde. He tried to save his fallen soldier, but he lost his hand to the ice-cold water. After cutting off the frozen hand, the men resumed their journey. Along the way, they would come across several strange sights. The first of these sights was a hill that had seemed to have been grazed and cleaved by a giant axe. Next, the man found several burned remains of humans and animals. Additionally, they also came across a carcass that looked half human and half ox. After completing the last leg of the journey, they reached the village that was once led by Bjorn Grimshaw. The village initially seemed deserted and full of charred corpses, but the brave Vikings were taken by surprise by five women who came out of nowhere. The women told the Vikings that Grimshaw and his men attacked their own, and especially the women. But a conflicting account was presented by a local named Finn, who claimed that it was the women who were behind the desecration of the village. The Viking leader decided to imprison the women and Finn, but when Finn tried to escape, Horde killed him. 
Clearly, there was something that Finn feared more than death. That night, one of the guards gets enticed by one of the five women. When the sun comes up, the guard is nowhere to be found. The Viking leader ordered his men to burn the bodies, but to everyone's utter shock and horror, Finn's body comes to life and transformed into the thing. The women try to escape, and Horde flung his axe, but it only managed to slice off Astrid's hair. They realized that the hair could live on its own. Therefore, in order to save other settlements, they decided to find the women and burn them all. The pursuit began, and the Vikings discovered that they were jumping into a deep pit in an attempt to fly away in their ship. However, they forced a herd of yaks to run into the pit, destroying the ship in the process. A fierce battle ensued, and the men were able to take down the women and burn them one by one. In the end, we see the clan leader and Horde waiting for help, but Horde might have been infected. Their fates are left for the readers to decide, and bear uncanny resemblances with the fates of Childs and MacReady from the original movie. Right now it's at least something. The thing, novel, and differences between the film. The novelization of popular movies was prevalent back in the 70s. Films like Star Trek, Star Wars, and Alien sold millions of novelized copies. Because the books and movies had to be released almost at the same time, the author almost never watched the movies. Naturally, the novel was often based on scripts and included several things that never made it to the final cut of the film. These things included axed actors, plot twists, etc. Essentially, the novels offer a sneak peek into what could have been. The novel for The Thing was written by Alan Dean Foster, whose words expanded the film's horizon as far as its mythology is concerned. It also gives us more dialogues, new scenes, and subplots. Let's take a look at the several differences between the Thing novel and the original film. The character of Windows was initially named Sanders. The name Sander went on to be the name of the Norwegian scientist who led the crew to a disastrous end in the 2011 film. When Mac and Copper go to the Norwegian camp to investigate, they find several audio tapes that detail the chaos unleashed by the Thing on the Norwegian outpost. Interestingly enough, the Americans back at Outpost 31 also find one such tape. Unlike the events of the film, when the Americans find the remains of the Thing from the Norwegian camp, they burn it down before it could affect anybody at the American base or Outpost 31. The Thing in the novel is much more infectious than the one in the film. In fact, even trace amounts of the Thing's infected blood could lead to the assimilation of a human being or any other organism for that matter. In the film, the Thing's aircraft is intact. However, in the novel, the Norwegians accidentally blow up the entire aircraft while trying to excavate it. In fact, this is what happens in the novella, The Thing from Another World. All had an interesting chase sequence with three characters, namely Mac, Bennings, and Childs, going after dog things on snowmobiles. However, this sequence was deleted from the film and the original script because picturizing it in such conditions would have proved to be very expensive. The crew on Outpost 31 finds very late that Blair had been trying to build a spacecraft to make an escape. However, in the novel, it suggested very early that Blair was doing something of that sort. In fact, quite early in the novel, several pieces of equipment start to go missing. The film kills Fuchs off the screen, but in the novel, he's killed by the thing. However, the most interesting and crucial difference between the novel and the film has to be the climax. In the novel, the survivors of the thing fortify their rec room. When the Thing finally presents itself, it goes on to kill Gary before going after Knowles in the washroom. Here, Knowles commits suicide instead of letting the Thing assimilate with him. Lastly, instead of blowing up Outpost 31, Mac chooses to destroy it using a tractor. Amidst the destruction, several of the hydrogen canisters explode, which ultimately kills the Blair Thing. The cancelled sequel, Return of the Thing, miniseries. Six years before the release of the 2011 prequel, Sci-Fi Channel announced in the year 2005 that a four-long miniseries was to be produced by Frank Darabont, the man behind films like The Shawshank Redemption and The Mist. However, the project found itself in a state of suspended animation because of several reasons, but it was actually the budgetary constraints that posed the biggest hindrance. Later, Universal Pictures decided to revive the franchise and release the 2011 prequel film. Nevertheless, the premise and the setting of the miniseries would have followed the path of the Alien franchise and would have been an action-packed, military-styled horror thriller. The screenplay, written by David Leslie Johnson, was set in the year 2005 and centered around the vast deserts of New Mexico. The Soviet scientists received the distress call from Outpost 31 and sent their men there after around six months. They recover the frozen corpses of Charles and McCready and also the alien spacecraft. Everything is taken to Russia, but a freak accident forces them to stop the research. The script then had a 23-year time jump when Chechen rebels take over the facility. And that's when things start to go haywire.
Everything you need to know about The Thing remake. There are talks of a reboot of the 1982 film by Blumhouse Productions and John Carpenter himself. It's speculated that the film would take notes from the expanded version of the novella. The reboot would place the film in a more contemporary setting and expand on The Thing from Another World, published by Dark Horse Comics. These talk about McCready's story after he escaped Antarctica's daunting cold weather. Before his death, Campbell sent a box of manuscripts to Harvard University. In 2018, author and biographer Alec Navala Lee discovered an unpublished manuscript titled Frozen Hell. This is, in fact, an extended version of the original novella and can well be called a novel. Nevertheless, the question remains if we really need a remake of the film. A new film based on John Carpenter's The Thing is always a welcome move, especially when he's expected to be attached to the film. However, Carpenter has refused to divulge information with the press. The past few years have seen a massive revival of classic franchises, and I think that the enhanced technology that exists today, The Thing could be the next big thing in the world of horror movies. What's your opinion? And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one, and be safe. Thanks, everyone.